Shane and I have been living in the Middle East for more than a year, Amy. We were living in Damascus, and we traveled all around the region. And northern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, was a new part of the Middle East that we were eager to explore. Um, Josh came to visit, and we all agreed that it was an exciting prospect. Um, we'd done research in the area. Northern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, is a semi-autonomous part of Iraq. And actually, in 2011, it was on the top 41 travel destinations in The New York Times. So no American has been killed or captured there in recent decades. It's not a war zone. And we went there, because uh, I had a week off work, and we wanted to enjoy ourselves. It's Explain the work you were doing more in Syria. Uh, I was working with Iraqi refugees. It was uh, the Iraqi Student Project, helping Iraqi young Iraqis who'd been in college when the U.S.-led war uh, started in Iraq, and, and um, they couldn't continue their education in Syria. They were barred from higher education. So we were helping them get into schools in the U.S. and, and Europe. And Shane, you were? Uh, I was working as a, as a journalist in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. and so Josh comes to visit you, and you go on this week's vacation to show him a good time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, our other friend, Sean McVessel, was there. He decided to stay in the hotel, thankfully for us, because he was the one that later was able to inform the embassy in Baghdad that we'd been captured. Um, we came to a tourist site called Ahmed Awa that had been recommended to us by several people. and. It was full of people, teeming with life, hundreds of uh, Kurdish with their families camping. It's waterfalls? Yeah, yeah. It's a small waterfall, but it's a, you know, any water is a big attraction in that area. It's, um, so it was, it was lovely. Someone pointed out a trail to us, and if, if we made any mistake, we hiked too far. We were maybe a bit overzealous and incredibly happy to be together. Uh, we saw a soldier in the distance, and he called for us to come to him, and of course, our first thought was, oh, this is a Kurdish soldier. We're going to have a cup of tea and interesting conversation. He Did might... anyone warn you at the hotel, by the way, you're going to be on the border, be very careful? No one mentioned it. Yeah, we went through several checkpoints. We actually saw Kurdish soldiers when we were at Ahmedawa, and um, no one mentioned our proximity to the Iranian border. Hmm. So, Josh, you're along for the ride here. You guys are hiking. You're seeing each other. It's a reunion. Um, uh, you haven't seen each other for a while. Talk about that hike. I, I had been um, teaching at a university program in uh, in Switzerland, India, Africa, and uh, what China. What were you teaching? It was a program. It was a program for American students studying international health health care. And um, when that program ended in, the, in May, I, I went and figured I should travel a little bit more before heading back to the United States. So I went to, to the Middle East and visited these guys. Ended up there a little bit longer than I expected. But uh, so when we were on the hike, we, um, when we got to the top, we soon, um, we soon realized that we were in Iran and this is not what we had expected. Can I just ask something? Do you think you actually crossed the border? How? I mean, was there a fence there? Was there some marker? No. No, no. So do you know if you had crossed the border before the Iranian soldier beckoned you? Uh, well, we were told, you know, after we were arrested, we were kind of taken across the ridge where there was kind of a, a hut, a kind of shack where the soldiers were, and there was one. One soldier spoke a tiny bit of English, and, you know, we, we said we want to go back to Iraq. We asked him where the border was, and uh, he, he pointed to this kind of path, you know, that uh, we had been walking on. And he said, that's the border. Um, and there was kind of like a little, little mound uh, alongside it. And so, you know, when they called us, we had actually crossed that, that path. Um, so, you know, from what he was saying, we, we crossed the border when, when they actually called us over. And, and he actually contacted Sarah uh, later uh, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. yeah. One of the soldiers contacted me on Facebook. I have so many people from our experience, other prisoners that we were selled alongside, um, have contacted me on, and many of all of us on Facebook. But he, at first, I didn't believe him. I said, OK, you know, this is Facebook. Why should I believe you? Prove it. And he gave me, he, he knew really specific details, and he convinced me that he was one of those soldiers. And I asked him, where's the border? And he said, it's the trail that we were walking on. So we were on on the trail, and they called us off the trail. And he apologized. He apologized. He apologized. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask, uh, through this broadcast, I'd like each of you to read a selection from A Sliver of Light. Let's start with Shane. Sure. Uh, this was a couple of days after we had uh, been arrested. We were being transferred around um, uh, western Iran, and uh, we, in, at nighttime, were put into a car and uh, were driven out in the countryside. 
Where are we going? Sarah asks in a disarming, honey-sweet voice. Sss, the pudgy man hisses, turning around to face us and putting his fingers, finger to his lips. The headlights of the car trailing us light up his face, revealing his cold, bored eyes. He turns back to face the front. The solitary lights of the country houses stream by like little meteorites. The car falls silent again. He picks up a gun in his right hand and cocks it three times. Sarah's eyes widen. Her posture stiffens. She leans towards the man in the front and, with a note of desperation, says, Ahmadinejad, good. Obama, bad. The pistol is resting on his lap. He turns to face us again and holds his two hands out with palms facing each other. Iran, he says, nodding towards his one hand. America, he says, lifting the other. Problem, he says, stretching out the distance between them. He checks our phases to make sure his message registered, then drops his arms. Sarah turns to me and starts. What does she see? Her eyes are penetrating. Do you think he's going to hurt us? She asks. I don't know whether to respond to her or just stare at her. I'm terrified. We walk into our fear together, letting it surround us softly like a fog. The immediate prospect of death seems so different than I had imagined it. In my mind, I see us pulling over to the side of the road and leaving the car quietly. My tremulous legs will convey me mechanically over the rocky earth. I will be holding Sarah's hand and maybe Josh's too, but I will be mostly gone already, walking flesh with no spirit. We won't kiss passionately in our final moments before the trigger pull. We won't scream. We won't run. We won't utter fabulous words of defiance as we stare down the gun barrel. We will be like mice, paralyzed by fear, limp in the slack jaw of a cat. We will just stand there. Each of us will fall, one by one, hitting the gravelly earth with a thud. Well, the interrogations, I mean, in the beginning we were hunger striking. I was completely disoriented, but I still had a hard time taking the, the line of questioning seriously because it was just um, a total farce. They were asking, they, one of the, the things they demanded of me is to draw a picture of the lobby of the Pentagon. Um, and I said, I've, I've never been to the Pentagon. You know, I've never even been to Washington, D.C. By this time, I've been there many, many times, but at that time, I hadn't. And he said, but you're a teacher. You know, all educated people, all teachers go to the Pentagon. And um, if I didn't, at some level, know that, you know, I was in serious danger, I couldn't—I would have laughed out loud. But at the same time, it was, you know, impo impossible to laugh. There were times that they asked me— uh one question I was asked was to the listed of several countries in the Middle East and asked me to name them in order of uh, what country is most subservient to the United States to least subservient. Uh, they asked me what newspapers are controlled by the CIA, these kind of things. I mean, sometimes it just seemed like whatever was coming to the top of the interrogator's head, you know, he would, he would ask. And they wanted your passwords. They wanted right. to check your yeah. email. Yeah. Was this an issue? Uh, you know, I initially refused in my first interrogation to give them my passwords, and then I was taken back to my cell and was in solitary confinement, and, you know, my head starts spinning immediately, and I, uh, you know, think I'm going to be here, sitting in here as long as I don't give them this password. So the next time I saw him, I gave it to him immediately. And, I, you know, I didn't have anything to hide, really, you know? I mean, you I don't— You were a journalist, so you right. were communicating with yeah. people. Yeah. And, you know, they uh, also managed to kind of wrap that into the narrative of being a spy. You know, they asked me, how, how did I get in touch with, uh, you know, defense think tanks in the U.S.? Not anybody can do that. And I would tell them, just go to the website. There's a contact button. You know, hit that button and you can send an email. And Josh, the questions they asked you? Uh, they, they were, you know, the main question, the one that I got every interrogation at least once and had to ask, was, what is your full biography? And it's kind of a tough question to answer in a few words, but that's what they'd ask. And then constantly asking, you know, what were you doing hiking there? So those are the two main questions. But for me, they seem to really be asking about my uh, my heritage and any trips I took to, uh, to Israel. My father's Israeli, and so half my family's in Israel, and they wanted to know what I did, who I met, what I—you know, and it was just like, well, I went to, you know, Aunt Yael's house, and we drank tea, and then I hit hummus, so we didn't do anything. So. Um, that, uh, and then they'd give me, like, a list of names, um, you know, to sort of identify, and I usually couldn't identify—I couldn't identify any of them. They were names that, to me, struck me as uh, quite Jewish names, but— um, uh, Did you say you were Jewish right away? And, uh, originally, no. I mean, they, originally, I, I didn't know what to say, and I, was, I just was like, I'm Christian. You know, I just was just sort of scared and thought I just might as well uh, hide that in the Islamic Republic of, of Iran. But again, their questions were— um, 
were totally. Uh, they, one of the first questions they asked me was, "Well, look, if you're really American, because they were accusing uh, me of being." Uh, French at the first stop was please spell supercalifragilistic expialidocious and I, you know and it's like really is it so it's a, it was very disorienting at the beginning but um, but at a certain point that that ended and they um, after two months the interrogations sort of wound down and they admitted that they that they knew we weren't spies but it had become political were there beatings psychological torture yeah, I mean, we could hear the beatings but uh, we weren't the object of those beatings. You were considered high-value prisoners. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that protected you? Eventually, sure. yeah. I mean, I think we realized in the beginning I was afraid that we would be beaten, that I would be raped. I'd heard stories of women being raped in Iranian prison, prisoners. Um, but we soon realized that we were too valuable, that we were, you know, indeed like um, an investment for the Iranian government, that they were eventually going to cash in for some sort of—they um, wanted to look strong and, and, and defiant, the Iranian government, and but eventually they, they didn't want to look cruel forever. So they would um, eventually let us go, and they didn't want us to be harmed. And we use that to our advantage, you know, the, knowing that we're valuable. Uh, we, we felt that we weren't, you know, subject to the— uh, you know, the same kind of things that a lot of uh, Iranian prisoners were subject to. Uh, we were pretty sure we weren't going to be physically tortured. Um, so we, you know, kind of in a sense had, had some power, knowing that we could push for better conditions. You know, if we went on hunger strike, they would worry, uh, because they didn't want us to come out uh, harmed, like looking, you know, like we had, we had been tortured. And, and solitary confinement is psychological torture. Um, I was in solitary confinement for 410 days, and the UN says that anything over 15 days can cause permanent and lasting damage and constitute torture. There have been scientific studies that say after two or three days, your brain waves start to shift towards stupor or delirium. It reduces you to an almost animal state. I spent hours and hours crouched by the small food slot in my door, just listening for sounds pacing compulsively, eating my food with my hands. Um, and there were times that I screamed and beat at the walls of my cell. And what people need to understand is that this doesn't only happen in places in countries like Iran or places like Guantanamo. This is a widespread and prevalent practice in our own country. We have 80,000 people in solitary confinement on any given day, many of them for years, many of them for decades. And these are not the most violent prisoners. Some of them have done violent things. A lot of them are in for arbitrary reasons. There's no oversight. Petty prison infractions. Describe what happened the day you thought you were hearing someone screaming. Yeah, that was um, the worst breakdown I've ever experienced. I, 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 lost, I lost a sense of who I was. Um, and I heard screaming, and it sounded—all I could think is I wanted it to stop. And it sounded far away. And um, then the doors of my cell burst open, and one of the guards came in and started shaking me. And I looked at her, and through her eyes I could see myself. And I realized that I'd been screaming, and I'd been beating at the walls. And they were um, streaked with blood. Yeah, my knuckles were, were bloody. Um, that was a dramatic moment. You know, the majority of time in solitary confinement is sped and spent pacing, um, trying to stop repetitive thoughts that just play again and again, um, trying to calm your fears and phobias and to, to focus on reading a book. When I eventually got books, I would have days where I'd read the same pages over and over again and understand nothing and get so frustrated I would just throw it at the wall. Mm -hmm. Talk about the meetings you would have in the courtyard. This was your one moment, Sarah, in the day of coming out of solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. What was the courtyard called? Havahori. Um, which means? It means um, eating air. <laughs> um, yeah, that, my whole life was oriented around those, those visits. I would plan my entire day just counting down the minutes um, with an activity to fill. Every, that, you know, every hour, every every minute until it happened. And then as it got closer and closer, I would get more and more nervous and agitated and always afraid that somehow it wouldn't happen. I never—you can never let your guard down. You're always hypervigilant. And there would be days where, because of weather or random, random reasons, they would refuse it. And um, I'd start pacing my cell and wringing my hands together, crying sometimes in it, just because I was anticipating um, the one relief I had. 
and we made the most of that time. We How long would you have together? Oh, it changed. In the beginning, it was only a half an hour a week, and then it was a half an hour a day, and eventually an hour a day. At the very end, it was two hours a day. And I think specifically, I have um, the UN to thank for that. The, the Special Rapporteur Against Torture demarched the Iranian human rights um, 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 government. On, about my case. And officially, um, solitary confinement is 22 to 23 hours alone a day. So I think they, they tried at the very end to, to get me out of solitary confinement. But according to the UN, I, you know, 22 hours a day is still solitary confinement. So um, that time was, it was often really difficult for me to come out of my my numbness and connect with them. It was hard to make eye contact. Sometimes I just wanted to stay in my own little shell, in my own, you know, box. But Shane and Josh would draw me out. They would make me laugh. They would make um, you know, just special moments happen again and again. And, and it brought me back from the edge of sanity countless times. Before it was Josh and Shane in one cell, and you for that long haul in solitary confinement, when you were side by side, you actually managed to get out of your cell one night. Yeah. Explain. Yeah. Uh, well, there was one, uh, one night that um, I think one of the guards was sick, and so the section that we were held in, uh, there was only one guard, and uh, it was there were female guards in that section. They they actually put me in the cell next to Sarah in the female part of the prison, uh, and but since uh, the men would always come up and bring me food, um, one one day one night uh, they left open the little door on my cell, the little window, and uh, I reached down and the key was in the door and I could open it. Um, so I, uh, late at night, opened the, opened the door and kind of peeked out, and they were still out there, and um, there was a vent between mine and Sarah's cell, and I said to her, um, just kind of jokingly, what, you know, what, what would you say if I said I could sneak into your cell through this vent? And she said, I would tell you to do it immediately. And, I, <laughs> and then I said, uh, okay, I'm going to do it. And she, I was serious, and she was kind of like, Wait a second. <laughs> I don't know if, I, if you should do this. You know, this is kind of crazy. But uh, we waited late into the night until the guards were sleeping, and I snuck out of my cell and went into her cell. Yeah. And of course, it was you know amazing to be. We'd been talking through event for the majority of days for weeks and weeks, um, but hadn't seen each other. And of course, it was wonderful to be able to touch and have physical intimacy. But it's also being able to get around the restrictions imposed on you as a prisoner. All prisoners do this. You'll, you'll spend every waking moment coming up with a plan on how to beat them, you know, how to get around their insane, horrible control. And, and that's, that's how you resist. That's how you stay sane and how you stop from becoming institutionalized. It was hard to smile reading a sliver of light, but when you both went back to your rooms and you found you were wearing each other's pants, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> what did that mean to you, that moment, since you were feeling so isolated, alienated from your own selves, let alone each other, to be able to get together like that? Mm -hmm. um, it meant that um, they couldn't break us. They couldn't. They could never tear us apart, um, that no matter how long it was until we saw each other again, until we were able to touch like that, um, we would, you know, nothing could, could break that, the bond between us. And Sarah, talk about the moment when one day you saw Shane, but you didn't see Josh. At first, you were alarmed. Yeah. Yeah, I um, as much as, as much as I knew that it was good for Shane and I have to have time alone together. The three of us were a unit, you know, an unbreakable team, and I I was always conflicted about whether or not Shane and I should have time alone because I wanted Josh there, and um, I thought maybe something had gone wrong. I was worried, but. Um, it was. Um, it definitely caught me off guard. It was an unusual place to be proposed to, um, but Shane is not a, a usual guy. <laughs> Talk about what you did, Shane. Uh, I well, I had decided while I was in solitary actually that I uh, wanted to marry Sarah. Um, it was we'd been together for a few years, and after she was taken away from me, it was very clear to me that I wanted to be with her for the rest of my life. And but I had thought I would do it when we got out of prison. You know, I didn't. Uh, was an ideal place to make a wedding proposal. But, you know, we we started getting a sense that Sarah might be released before us, and I didn't know when I would see her again. And so I uh, made a, a ring, you know, in my cell out of thread. Um, it was one of many examples of kind of 
using what we had, you know, to uh, to, to get by. And uh, I didn't tell Josh what I was doing because I, I, I didn't know if I would go through with it, you know. Whether I was in prison or not, I was still nervous, you know. <laughs> and uh, I went outside and, you know, um, gave her this thread ring and, and asked her if she would marry me. I mean, it, it gave us something to hang on to. It gave us one guarantee that we would have a life together. Um, and when you have absolutely no certainty and everything has been taken from you, it means a lot. Mm -hmm.